cyberpunk can play this double game of if you read a you read the novel or you watch the film and you're like immersed in it and you're dragged through this cool narrative and then afterwards you think about it still and so i have always wanted that in books that i read i want to think differently i want to um have my mind blown by a culture or an idea or a um a new way of thinking or a new technology or understanding how a technology can be used. And I want to, and I want it to change me in a way. Uh, and that's what books that stay in your mind have rewired your pathways very slightly. Your neuron, this is the science. This is not just a, me speaking romantically. This is the science of it. Um, so really good books change you. And I think, so cyberpunk has all those things that ha- that I love. I love this cool science fictional world. I love imagining near future uh, uh, and medium future civilization and what it's going to look like. I like to think. I like, you know, I like seeing emerging of cultures as well. So it has it all. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 122 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always, my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hello, I am doing lovely. How are you? Doing fantastic here on this fine evening. And I uh, just want to shout out my girl's books because she's the best. And if you want to get thieving, you can pick up Among Thieves, her debut novel, the blue baby right there. And if you want to continue the thieving, then you can pick up the sequel, The Gas Thieves, The Green Baby, and just uh, enjoy. It's a finished duology, so you can start it and finish it and not have to wait like a decade or more. Uh, <laughs> For the next know. installment. Yeah. <laughs> of your thieving books looking at you, Scott yeah. Lynch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. Uh, Shots fired, man. <laughs> and if you want to support Adrian, check out Mushroom Blues for your, you know, lovely dose of fungal punk noir goodness. Ooh, look that at that. That would have been a good, that like, TikTok turn. transition. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> You've been <laughs> practicing, dude. <laughs> Uh, as well, a quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Fanfighter YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. Also, a quick shout out to our newest patron on Patreon, Catherine Dow. Thank you so much for contributing to the Patreon and helping us do what we do here. And now, welcoming today's guest, welcoming him, welcoming him back to SFF Addicts. T.R. Napper, author of 36 Streets, Ghost of the Neon God, Neon Leviathan, Aliens, Bishop, and the brand new novel, The Escher Man. I actually got this copy from Tim himself. So thank you for that, buddy. Got this beautiful- Brand little- new, not even out yet, mate. Right? It is I was when this gonna episode say, goes live. Super fancy. Oh, yeah. We're <laughs> recording when, it go, when this episode future. goes, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. so fair enough. It's, yeah. <laughs> but welcome back, Tim. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on again. It's good to be back. <laughs> Pleasure, buddy. Pleasure. I'm gonna put your book right here, so we get a little of that. Promo. Oh, nice. There Ooh, we yeah. go. A little, little it promo. Even, it even action. has a little bit of a match with uh, with Mushroom Blues. Uh, all right, yeah. let's start off with an intro for listeners who aren't familiar with you. If you can tell them a little bit about yourself and your work. Um, so I'm a science fiction writer, a cyberpunk writer. Um, uh, you've just introduced a few of my all of my books. Um, I although I did start in short fiction. I came to writing late. I uh, was an aid worker for a decade living in different parts of Southeast Asia, um, running poverty alleviation programs. And so that's um, – and I made the the atypical career jump from aid worker to science fiction writer. <laughs> but that's, uh, as you would imagine, informed my work. Um, yeah, I mean, it formed it deeply. I was living in Vietnam when I started my my first novel, Thirty Six Streets. Um, what else to say? I'm a short story writer and a novelist, and and I guess you got to find out all out about me in this interview, I suppose. And you're a great guy with a lovely accent. <laughs> <Also> that. <laughs> Yes, 
well, you kind of had, you, you've hinted that you had an interesting um, journey into writing sci-fi, <laughs> but we like to dig into the nerdy origins of all of our guests. Um, okay. So even back before uh, you transitioned into writing, uh, do you remember your first, your first loves in the science fiction and fantasy genres, like the, those books or TV shows, movies, whatever it was in your formative years that really caught you from Specfic? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was a voracious reader, which is useful if you want to be a writer at some point. Um, although at the time, I just loved books. Um, uh, in fact, I was obsessed with books, I think, from a very, very young age. Um, the first books that struck me, <clears throat> I've actually, I, I've, I've kept some, I've got a little shelf with some childhood books, series that I, that I was obsessed with. But uh, on reflection, looking back, I don't know if any of the series are that good, but um, the the ones I remember when I was young that I was obsessed with were like, well, like everyone, the Belgariad, you know, that one, and uh, a series called The Amtrak Wars, which was kind of a, a few science fiction fantasy fusion, which was involving magic but also high tech wagon trains that would dry across drive across the dystopian American wilderness after a nuclear war and it's pretty cool. I've never uh, heard about that one. It sounds many awesome. Yeah. Land. <laughs> uh, and, and in fact the many colored land was also a fusion of sci fi fantasy. Um but the one that really affected me I think uh that probably might might still influence me now would be probably Philip K. Dick the first time I read him. Uh, that kind of blew my mind. Um, it's so he's so paranoid, uh, and he kind of makes you question the nature of reality. You know, when you read his works, oh, it's a short story collection too. Um, so that was early on. Probably Philip K. Dick was the one, and then I, a bit later on, I would have read 1984, but that wouldn't have been until, you know, 18 or 19, or, or maybe earlier. No, it would have been in high school. they make you read it. So high, so 1984, and then I got obsessed with dystopian fiction, so I read Brave New World and The Handmaid's Tale, uh, and I always and I was attracted to that genre. Um, but also being a cyberpunk writer, I was, <clears throat> and this is, wouldn't have been to my 20s or 30s even, but the visual aspect of cyberpunk is in a way it's sometimes the most dominant. And so sometimes the hit for cyberpunk writers and on the genre, the biggest influences are visual. They're not literary. So it's Blade Runner and it's Ghost in the Shell. Those two in particular were a huge, hugely influenced me in my thinking about cyberpunk in particular. A lot of its themes around um, what it means to be human and so forth. That, that's cool stuff that cyberpunk tackles. Um, I should be better at this question about formative influences because <laughs> it comes up a lot in interviews and I always muff it up. But anyway, because I know I'm always it. forgetting. Yeah, I'm always you've forgetting. got great answers. <laughs> <laughs> We're I never going to. I, I after every, every time I do it, I, I, I think about it after I go, oh, you're like, oh, I forgot the biggest one or whatever, yeah. But we're never going to remember <laughs> yeah. anything. I fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, like, Philip K. Dick, you and I have talked about PKD a little bit in the past, but, like, that, yeah. I think, especially for someone who transitioned into dystopia and cyberpunk and that kind of stuff, Philip K. Dick is a really good bedrock for a lot of the themes and sort of atmosphere that those genres evoke. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit more about your time in, in Southeast and East Asia, cause you, you hinted at it a little bit, but like, I think those experience are all experiences are also super formative and like the ways in which you, you know, coming from Australia, uh, and, and being able to compare your upbringing with these vastly different cultures where the language is different, uh, environments are different. How was it for you in terms of those experiences and, and how it affected how you view the world? Um, gee, it's a big question. I mean, I think in a way, when, when I first, 
the first trip I did to Asia wasn't Southeast Asia, it was Mongolia. And I went there 20 years ago. Um, well, like I was, I had a, I was a volunteer and I was working with like street children and um, in the capital. Um, but I chose it because I wanted to choose the most radically different culture than Australia um, that I could find in a way and kind of test myself uh, and see if this was back then that was the, it was the career I wanted. Uh, and also in a way, one of the hardest environments. It is radically different. Um, but I have to say, like, before I get to the differences, like people are the same as well. <laughs> We're all human beings. And this is the thing that struck me is the sense of humor, for example, like Mongolia, it's, sort of, geez, it's just such a radically different culture. But the sense of humor is very similar to Australian sense of humor, for example. People's needs, what people want for themselves and their families uh, and the dreams that they have, these aren't so very different, you know. So I, I think for me it certainly partly reinstalled a, or reinforced a universalist notion of who we are. Um, but, of course, yeah, the, the, it's interesting, though. I have to, I'll, I'll put it this way. Like when you travel overseas, you kind of steal yourself from different cultures and you're kind of open to it and you're learning and you're thinking. Uh, and I think that I think to some extent you, we have emotional intelligence and we have our raw IQ, but I think cultural intelligence is probably a thing as well. I think people uh, – I've noticed people – over the many years, some just adapt very quickly and some just find it too challenging when they move to a new culture. Adrian, you uh, you live what's what I always forget where you live, but it's in Ecuador. South America somewhere. Yeah. So you might have seen this in your experience. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was about to say is you really don't understand how different things were until you go home. So I'm open to it when I go to uh, abroad, but when I come back to Australia, all these things I'd stopped noticing or didn't notice about my own country are suddenly apparent to me. And it might be, for example, I can remember back to when I first came back and it was like how selfish people were, how focused they were on material accumulation, uh, how ag unnecessarily aggressive. And even like I was living in Hanoi, which if you've been there is one of the most aggressive cities in the world. <laughs> But it's aggression that all makes sense in terms of chaotic and wild and it's not it's it's not a malicious type of aggression. But then you come home and then people are just walking around angry and driving angrily on these beautiful big roads with plenty of space. So it always struck me when I came back. Um, even things like coming back and there's all these signs saying, you know, don't speed and don't do this and don't do that. All reasonable things. Don't speed. Don't drink and drive. They're all bad. But go, coming back, I'd feel oppressed by all the instructions I was getting all the time, you know. Um, so I think it's when you return you realise the what the other these countries had and to some extent it had a greater sense of community. It had a greater sense. It was far more chaotic. The world was far more random. Um, and you had to be open to randomness and new experiences. Um, and, of course, there are many, many cultural-specific things that I go into in some of my fiction around the nature of family and the nature of cuisine and the, the culture of the street and all this type of stuff. So, yeah, but I, for me, some of the most striking dis differences are coming home. I was living in Hanoi when I um, became a writer. I decided... I was going to start right, taking taking writing seriously, although I never really even thought about being a writer for a very, very, until my mid-30s, I would, I would think. Um, never imagined I'd have a book on the shelf, you know, with a name on the spine. That was not even a, not even a daydream, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like a idle speculation. It wasn't even conceived. But I was living in Vietnam. So, of course, when you decide, when you do, you have your life experiences, of course, but setting has always been a massive influence on me. I'm sure it is on most people, but I suspect setting affects me probably more so. And so Vietnam was a huge influence, yeah. The, 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 the city and the history and the vibrancy and the chaos. 
uh, and the smells and the sounds and the people uh, and the life on the street that was a massive influence on me when I when I started writing. How was it? How was it becoming a stay at home dad? And like, because you and I are in a, in a similar situation where I actually I started writing more seriously once I became a stay at home dad as well. But like, how was it kind of tackling the fucking madness that is parenting paired with the fucking madness that is writing in the fucking madness that is a city like Hanoi <laughs> and all these things at the same time? I mean, I I I loved it, man. Like I um. It's you know it, being a parent <coughs> being a parent is a job that <laughs> uh, you don't it's it's unpaid labor obviously we know this but um my son would sleep for two hours in the day and I would write in those two hours so it's a really good focus way to learn very early on how to focus and get your words done in an X amount of time uh, and then in the evening I would write again when he went to bed but. Um, I'd been working, I'd also been working full time forever or multiple jobs forever until that moment, probably since I was 18, you know, in fact, I started working before then. Um, so it was just a relief (laughs) not to be in that sort of grind. It was still hard work, but it's like, I'm with my son and I'm creating fiction. It was amazing. My partner was working at the time. So. I didn't have to financially, I didn't have to stress for three years, um, which is a huge, uh, which is, um, you know, it's an opportunity that not many people get, I suppose. Again, I was raising a child. (laughs) I still did other work at the same time, but uh, mainly I could focus on those two things, my son and my writing. And so, yeah, I took, I made the best of it. I had to deal with myself. I'd, I'd take three years. And it, while we were living there, and if at the end of three years I published a couple of stories and knew I wasn't crap, I'd keep going. And so at the end of those three years, I published a few short stories. And so I had the bug, man. Yeah. And then it never leaves you. Now you're stuck for life. <laughs> you are. It's a big, it's like a, it's like an, it's a good obsession, but it's an yeah. obsession. It's like a compulsion. At the, yeah. No, I get cranky if I, if I go too long without creating. Oh. Yeah. Same, same. I get um, the only time I'm not the only the only reason I ever worry about like these interviews are really good, but and I, the only thing that bothers me is that I'm not writing. <laughs> right. Sorry to take you away from your writing, Tim. Yeah. No, no, no. I just I just think about I just think about um, uh, doing the writing afterwards. But no, if I go, I, I, well, I mean, I try and take Sundays off. But if I go too long without writing, I uh, yeah, I get it. I get ups. I get I'm, I'm unhappy. Um, Worldcom is interesting, actually, um, uh, because that's I was including travel as like seven or ten days. I didn't write, but that was so much, and I did get, I was getting a bit unhappy by that at the very by the very end. But because we was just talking about writing and talking with writers and talking about writing, I kind of it. It, it, tam- it tampered that down a little bit. It tampered it all down. Yeah, yeah, it tampered it all down. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, let's use our time on the interview and talk about writing uh, <laughs> so that we can get that satisfaction from it. I want to dive into cyberpunk and noir uh, and why these genres are the ones that appeal to you, that have kind of spoken to you uh, to the point that, um, you know, if listeners don't know, you have a doctorate in creative writing with a thesis in noir, cyberpunk, and Asian modernity, which is dope. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what drew you to those elements? Why cyberpunk? Uh, I think you can do it in many subgenres, but cyberpunk mm. has the... Um, It marries – it plays this double game that science fiction can play and it marries and it mushes together a lot of things I really love. So it's cool. It's got – it looks awesome. It's it's got that factor. Um, It has great settings. Uh, Usually – not always, but usually settings in cyberpunk or very often are in the East or East-West fusion. 
So I really love that. Um, and it can tell really compelling stories in those worlds. Um, there's mind-bending technology and it can be quite th- it's quite a th- can be quite a thrilling genre and an immersive one but at the same time it's got fascin- it's got i think politics and ideas that are on i could have continuing relevance but also very interesting for me so cyberpunk talks about and it, it asks the classic science fiction question of what it means to be human it looks at technology and it looks at how technology can dehumanize. Um, so that's super relevant for the world that we live in. It looks at what we're losing with all these advancements. Um, it's almost, I'm not going to say spiritual, but it's concerned about the human spirit uh, and it's current concerned about the human condition. And I think that it focuses on things like staggering inequality and corporate control and surveillance and individual autonomy and all stuff that's more relevant than ever. So cyberpunk can play this double game of if you read a you read the novel or you watch the film and you're like immersed in it and you're dragged through this cool narrative and then afterwards you think about it still. And so I have always wanted that in books that I read. I want to think differently. I want to um, have my mind blown by a culture or an idea or a, um, a new way of thinking or a new technology or understanding how a technology can be used. And I, wanna, and I want it to change me in a way. Uh, and that's what books that stay in your mind – have rewired your pathways very slightly, your neuron. This is the science. This is not just a, me speaking romantically. This is the science of it. Um, so really good books change you. And I think – so cyberpunk has all those things that, ha- that I love. I love this cool science fictional world. I love imagining near future uh, uh, and medium future civilization and what it's going to look like. I like to think. I like – you know, I like seeing emerging of cultures as well. So it has it all, MJ. Yeah. It's got it all, man. <laughs> it does. It does. And speaking speaking of books that change you, I mean, I remember reading Neon Leviathan years ago, years ago, before I even knew what Grimdark Magazine was, even though that book is published by Grimdark Magazine. I'm like, I don't know who the fuck this publisher is, but this book looks awesome. Uh, and just reading that, and you brought up that sort of East-West merging, that sort of uh, marriage that often goes on in cyberpunk, but I'd never seen cyberpunk that was obviously it's like Japan is very prevalent. Uh, China is very prevalent, but Southeast Asia here and there, but I think you really capture Southeast Asia and its relationship with Australia and setting cyberpunk in Australia was something that I'd never seen at that point. And it was just fascinating to me to kind of like feel cause Australia in and of itself, it's like if you look at films like Blade Runner, um, you know, especially Blade Runner 2049, which is the the sort of sequel uh, to the original film, they're going out into this like almost apocalyptic wasteland. And Australia, it's, it's harsh de- deserts and harsh environments almost feel apocalyptic and and – for you, like I wanted to ask you, like what it what it's like for you to represent Australia in the context of this genre that is so closely associated with the future and with technology and these kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to your original part of your question, you're right. Like cyberpunk is, in its foundation, was heavily influenced by Japan, and to some extent Hong Kong. So Blade Runner. Ridley Scott saw Hong Kong or part of Hong Kong and like, wow, that's the future. William Gibson writing Neuromancer was writing in the 80s when Japan was – some people liked this idea, many more feared it as Japan as uh, kind of a superpower and we were going to have a Japanese future. So William Gibson, he never 
been to Japan, but I think he kind of fetishized it in a way in Neuromancer. So those, the Hong Kong connection and the Japanese connection are, are right there in the, like in the source code for, um, for Cyberpunk. Um, but you're right. There's, there's, a, there's a handful of writers who look at Southeast Asia, but not many. Um, and if you want to think of high-tech, low-life, um, that can be Southeast Asia. When I'm there, I feel like I'm living on the edge of the future because I feel like this is where the future is going to happen, you know? I don't feel it as much here in Australia. So, um, yeah, and as in, as in, as in, in terms of writing about Australia, it's fast. Like I did when I did my doctorate, I wanted to do just cyberpunk traditions outside of America. That's all I wanted to look at, and I, and include, of course, I wanted to do Australia as one of them. We didn't have any. <laughs> well, we do, but there's 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 just a there's a couple of writers. Um, who've done a little bit of cyberpunk, but there's no, you wouldn't say there's a tradition. So I went back and looked at our different science fictional traditions and so forth. But, uh, and which is, of course, as you say, is usually associated with the bleakness of the environment. And so the problem with cyberpunk is it's the dark city. And then, but if you think about Australia, it's Mad Max. Yeah. So they don't seem to go together. So that's why I, why I wrote Ghost of the Neon God. <laughs> I put those things together um, because uh, cyberpunk, can happen outside of the city uh, and these ideas can be explored uh, in any environment. The city is just a metaphor or can be a good metaphor. If you're in a rainy, dark city drenched in neon, what we're really exploring is the internal psychology of the protagonist who is alienated and atomized in this, um, in a dangerous place that um, sort of offers no comfort really. But if you're out in the desert, which is the opposite environment, and the sun is beating down on you and there's no shade and the land oppresses, how, and that's how it feels here sometimes, that's the internal disposition of the protagonist as well. It's alienating. The environment's out to get you. So in a way, it seems like the opposite, but in a way, psychologically, it, 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 you, they're doing the same thing. Yeah. Well, I like, I I like that like, about, psychological oh. analog is a really cool way to think about it. Yeah. Well, I, I want to dive more into Ghost of the Neon God. Um, recent novella for anyone that hasn't picked it up yet. What are you doing? Go check it out. It's great. Um, you know, you, you, you've mentioned this kind of wanting to set it in Australia, but I'm curious, where did the, uh, how did the whole thing come about? Where did the idea for Jack and his story, um, cool. you know, how did that kind of come to be? Well, I'll pull back the curtain for everyone or all the viewers. The creative process is a mess <laughs> and you never really, really know. Um, it was a short story in like, and just part one was a short story in Interzone in like 2017. And that was it. I'd written a short story. I was done. I really liked the character. I loved it. I liked that I could do, set something in Melbourne. But I kept thinking about it. Um, and so I decided to write a second short story that took place exactly like right as it ended. But, and I mean, you two will appreciate this. I had to write a short story that seemed completely self-contained and had no, nothing like, you didn't need to do any homework. It was its own thing. So I had to write a short story and it took me forever because it's, just on a craft and technical level, it's actually really difficult. Um, but I sold that to F and SF. And then so that was done. And then I kept fucking thinking about it. So another year, then, so that was 2021. And then a year later, I'm like, well, I've got to finish this story. And then so I just thought, thought stuff it, I'll turn it into a novella. And I wrote the third part. So this is, sorry, and this, so the second part goes out into the desert. And that's where that's incorporated in. Um, yeah, and then I wrote the third part and became a novella and I did the so-called fix-up, the fix-up novella, and it's harder than a normal novella. Don't try it. Because <laughs> you have to go back and make every – there's ripple effects through the whole work when you change one little detail, you know. But 
so everything you have to do a lot of retro fitting for the story, but you also have to in every one you would have repeated the same information, blah 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 blah, but because it's a new story each time, so you have to go and change all that as well. So it took forever. Uh, where did the idea come from? Um, well, I mean, I was actually I was reading all these dense, bloody philosophical tomes. Um, uh, when I was doing my PhD and they had fascinating ideas that no one would ever know about, yeah, because like six people are going to read some of these books. When they're, when you've got this tome and it's an essay in a tome and it's about architecture and memory, for example, super interesting but super obtruse language and really impenetrable and I thought, fuck, these ideas are fascinating. And the great thing about fiction is we can take all these complex, dense ideas that normally wouldn't see the light of day and we can give them the light of day. This is the benefit of fiction. Um, if it's climate fiction or, or, or cyberpunk or whatever it may be, you can take things that maybe people don't think about very often and bring them into more of a mainstream consciousness. So that part, that was part of my motivation, actually. Now I remember. Thank you for – I didn't haven't thought about this in a very long time. But that that was – for the original story, I think that was de- definitely part of it, yeah. And that's where, like uh, – because at the, at the beginning, this is no spoiler. It's like the two characters are, are you know, causing mischief and smoking, smoking weed. <laughs> spoilers. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> such spoilers, man. Um, but one of the characters uh, – uh, Cole, um, he, when he gets high, he has these like philosophical musings and stuff. And I feel like this is, this is Tim channeling some of that, uh, some of that academic work into the story, but it's like, you can do that as fiction writers is just like infuse grander ideas within the dialogue or within the subtext of a story. And, and like you said earlier, people will just sort of like, they'll, have an awesome time with this, with this, you know, really fast paced, high octane story, lots of amazing stuff going on, lots of action and whatnot. But then there's so much stuff that, that sinks into the subconscious. And later on, you'll think about like, oh, wow, like I, I want to explore this more or, or just be engaged or curious about an idea that you'll at least move a little bit forward with it. And, 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 hopefully learn a little bit something uh, more about that particular topic, which is the beauty of science fiction and fantasy does this a, a lot as well. It's like you can infuse these ideas and don't be afraid to, you know, just mm. don't do it in an obnoxious yeah, it, I mean, way or like, <laughs> like, exactly. a, you know, exactly. don't be preachy. There's a craft <laughs> angle. Yeah. There's a craft angle. Um, but it's, but in that, you know, People, it's, I'm, it's early days for me, so I'm not getting carried away here and making big claims, but sometimes people put up, um, like on your Goodreads page or whatever, they put up quotes or you find your quotes through the book that they like. The quotes that people like, one of the quotes they like the most, like the second most of everything I've ever written, is like in Ghost of the Neon God where he's talking about memory and architecture. And so they put that quote up, which is actually a really, again, it's one of these really obscure ideas that has made its way into the story and clearly people have found it super interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's – that's, and this is where – I don't want to say activist, but this is where – and, you know, some fiction can be pure entertainment and that's good too. Uh, and I just – I love reading fiction that's pure entertainment. But you can have that role uh, when you write um, of putting things – into people's consciousness that um, – and and the challenge is to, to do it in a way that's accessible and you're not being obscure and you're not just info dumping. Um, you're not just using characters as cardboard cutouts <laughs> to say shit that you want to say. It all has to be – it all has – it's this this super challenging idea of mix, putting in theme and story and character and it's all, it's all coming together in a way that feels natural and, all, and organic. Yeah. The challenge is challenging them without knowing that they're being challenged. Yeah. So meta. Yeah. And speaking of challenging, you brought up, you know, retrofitting a story. Let's go to the Escher Man, your newest novel, which was also, we've talked about this before. I think when we chatted around when 36 Streets came out, uh, that you wrote the Escher Man before 
uh, before publishing that one. Uh, and then I just wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit, like why you felt you needed to put that novel aside, but then coming back to it and retrofitting it and how many iterations it went through that whole process. God, it's a, it's a saga. But if you, but for you two, did you publish your first novels or no. did, do you have, thank God. No. Oh Enjoy. my God. I have like five <laughs> trunked ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. I always hate those people briefly and they're like, right? oh, I published my first novel. And you think, like, oh, fuck yourself. Nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was preparing myself to be nice to you two. No, no, I have a lot of trunk novels. And uh, I thought um, I thought Escher Man was going to be trunked. I wrote it. Um, I even got an agent with it in, back in 2017. And um, so it was before... 36 streets it was done um but it 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 got a lot of rejections and it, and i think the agent lost faith faith in it i guess it's fair to say i'm truncating the story really it, this this is a saga which i could take another hour but i'm not going to do that to you or your viewers but the agent lost faith and then i think um i lost faith in the book but also the agent, so I got rid of him. <laughs> You're just like, clean um, plate, start over. Him. Just a loss of faith across <laughs> the board. <laughs> yeah. But I think I think that we have to, as you know, if you've trunked novels, you know that there's a time. Some have to be trunked. Um, and it sucks. <laughs> uh, or you put, you put, imagine, like, I couldn't um, conceive of it before writing my first. Like, when I was writing my first, the idea it would be trunked was um, inconceivable because it's such a huge thing to finish your first, and it's so hard. Anyway, and you humil- and you kind of you show it to people, and like when I think of my first novel that I showed to people, I'm like, "Fuck, God, that's embarrassing." <laughs> yes, right. I just get humiliated. People uh, that don't write uh, frequently ask me, and they're like, "Oh, well, now that you've got." Your foot in the door. Are you going to go back and get those other ones published? No. And I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> never. No. And, I, and I was the same. So I didn't think I was going to go back to Esher Man. I'm like, yeah. oh, no, I've I've developed as a writer. Um, uh, I've, I've, you know, I've, you know, I've grown and I've written something better and so I don't need to go back again. That was what I was thinking. So I was trunked. And it was trunked for years and years and years. And then maybe four years after I trunked it, I thought to myself, I kept thinking about the bloody story. And I thought, oh, I'll have a look, just because I'm wondering. I was kind of actually doing it as an exercise to see how I developed um, and so, sort of like, oh, okay, this is stuff I used to do and I'm, I'm glad it wasn't published, that type of thing. And I was just going to read the beginning. But it's fucking interesting story. And so I, I like, oh, shit, this is a good story. It's not executed well enough. But the story idea is really good. In fact, I'd forgotten how it ended. So at one, one point I'm like, how the fuck did he get out of this? That's a good sign. <laughs> you're like, you're like uh, discovery writing is something that already exists. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. Rediscovery writing. <laughs> Rediscovery so writing. I, um, <laughs> shit. I rewrote it. I rewrote it in 21 or 22 and it took me months and months and months and like I, re- I, I was rewriting on every single page, yeah, and scenes that went and some substantial sections like chunks of say 5,000 words that were added and it became so much better. So it's interesting. It's 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 called the same. It was the Escher Man back then. It's the Escher Man now and it's like that. Do you know, there's that thought experiment, the ship, the ship of Theseus or Theseus. You know that thought experiment where it's like if you have a boat and you replace everything on the boat, every plank, all the ropes, but it's the same shape. Is it a different boat? That type of thing. It kind of feels like that with the novel because I replaced every fucking plank of it. But the shape of the story is the same. Uh, and so my. It was the third novel I ever wrote, but it became the, like, fifth I ever published or something like this. 
Um, so it's a strange feeling. It's hard for me to get, even with the rewrite, it's hard for me to get a sense of the book in a way because it took 10 years um, from beginning to end. Uh, I'm, it's surreal and it's awesome that it's out, um, but it kind of, given I resigned it to the dustbin for, for years and years and years, it's very weird as well. Yeah, you were well. I'm glad you were able to resurrect it, uh, even though it sounds like a, a kind of arduous process. But uh, can you pitch listeners on the version of the Usher Man as it exists now? Let's get them hyped up to go check it out. So, what is it? What is it about? In your own words, I did a pitch at uh, Worldcon. Cause if I can remember, you practiced, man. <laughs> you told me you were, you, were, yeah, you told me you were anxious about it, but I said just just fucking suck it up and do it. <laughs> I did. Let okay, me see if I can replicate. It's been two weeks. Um, so, according to the publisher, it's a multi-layered and cerebral cyberpunk thriller. Uh, and so, when we say punk, we mean well, what I mean is so it's anti-corporate, it's countercultural, it's anti-elite, um, it's anti-authoritarian in particular, but it's also high. Like all good cyberpunk is high tech, low life, and all my work I focus on the low lives, um, the outsiders. The low life in the Escher Man is Endel Ebbinghaus, who was a street level in- enforcer for a drug cartel. He is a thug, a violent man, or is he? Or is he? Because in Endel's world, memory manipulation, memory wipes memory implants have become a weapon of choice for the powerful Um, because Endel also has a family um, that he loves uh, and he desperately wants to leave this life. He wants to escape his fate as the Escher Man, walking up an infinite staircase built on false memories. He wants to get out of the loop, um, this infinite loop where he can't create, uh, I should say he can't evolve, he can't love, he can't change. He can't be. So Endel has to escape. He has to save his family. He has to get out of Macau, the city that he's in, and he has to take revenge. That's the Escher Man pitch. (laughs) That was good, man. That was fantastic. And you brought up one of the big things, which I think is uh, is memory. And this is something that, that reading all of your work, memory plays such an important role an important thematic role in, in a lot of your stories. So I wanted to ask you, you know, it's like with the Escher man and, and Endel's story where there's memory manipulation going on and this sort of, uh, loop that he's stuck in. Why is memory so important to this story, but also to you as a storyteller? Uh, it's an obsession. Like, like, again, like many creative writing obsessions in some ways, you never quite know where it, came from but suddenly it's there everywhere in your work like fucking mushrooms or something (laughs) (laughs) wink wink (laughs) um um uh so but Escher Man it deals with memory more maybe than any other work that I have um I read I was fascinated by the subject I wrote short short stories about memory then I read all these scientific like accessible scientific books about memory and the science of it, and it's just such a fascinating topic. So why do I write about it? It is a trope in cyberpunk, yeah? So if we think about or go back to Blade Runner or Ghost in the Shell and Blade Runner, all the replicants have photographs and are desperate, desperate, desperate to form memories. Rachel in that has false memories and doesn't know she's a replicant. And then there's this idea of, well, if you have false memories and your memories of someone else's life, but you feel fully formed as a human, are you human? So it goes right back to Blade Runner and then in Ghost in the Shell, as another example, she has memories, but she doesn't know if they're her own. But also she works for the police, but she's also owned by a corporation. If she ever leaves employment, they own her memories. So memories are cool as a metaphor and as a literal thing. They're cool as a metaphor because they represent the soul, I think, in a way. They're a metaphor for the human spirit. So, like, they're everything we are. 
<laughs> all our fears and our phobias and our the, the most important things in our lives are stuck in memory. And when if you think of someone without memory, you know, the tragedy of, say, Alzheimer's, that's sometimes it feels like they're an empty shell in a way. They're not, but it can feel like that. So is the memory our souls? And then that in turn is like a metaphor for technological change and how we're being dehumanised and things like this. But memory as a literal scientific thing is also fascinating because it is fundamental to who we are, but it's so fragile. We misremember all the time. We forget all the time. Um, memories get confused with other memories. So we have this fragile aspect of our minds, which is fundamental to who we are as human beings, that is so, so very fragile and easy to manipulate too. Like even without technology, um, we know that, you know, you could, people have been, there's false memory syndrome and people have been told things over and over and then they start to believe it in their minds. We know that with smartphones, um, or this is a phenomenon that they've been um, uh, exploring, is the idea of uh, exomemory and cognitive offloading. So this is an exomemory. We put memory, this, this serves a memory function for us, like birthdays and phone numbers. That's useful. Or directions we on a map or how to get around a, like a physical yeah. space. It serves a memory function. Mm -hmm. But when we use it all the time, we're not using this muscle anymore, memory muscle, we're using this one. So studies are starting to look at cognitive offloading and that our memory function declines the more and more we rely on, say, Google and to look up things all the time. We know a word. Do we sit there for another one minute and try and remember the word or the band name or do we just use this? And the more, instead of just sitting there for another couple of minutes and letting your memory function do it itself, we go to our exo memory, this stuff can, can, they think, decline. So there's also a literal thing about technology and memory. So this is why memory is so super interesting because there's all these metaphors, but there's all these literal ways that affects our day to day life. Um, I it got to the point where I was so obsessed I had to make myself write about something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's good, and it's and in science fiction is great for this sort of stuff, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you you mentioned kind of the. Uh, uh, sometimes unreliable nature of memory, does that tie into telling a narrative through the perspective of kind of an unreliable narrator? Oh, God, yeah. And so that's probably why I couldn't write it the first time because, as you two know, like unreliable narrators are really bloody hard as at a technical level. And an unreliable narrator who's getting memory wiped and you have to think in every single scene what they know and what they don't know, and how much you can tell the audience is really fucking hard. Oh, and so there was a question about how many edits. A million, a million edits on this goddamn thing because it's so intricate. Um, and the just at a pure technical level, it's challenging, and it also has to be seamless and readable throughout. That's bloody hard. Have you two done? And have you have you have you done unreliable narratives in your work? I have, but only for, uh, it's a multi-POV work and only one of them is real unreliable. So I kind of got off yeah. a little easy. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have me. to do the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same for you, Adrian. Yeah. yeah. It's like one out of three POVs was like slowly yeah. like going into a descent of like being more and more uh, off kilter with reality. Yeah, it's, it's just at a technical level, it's really hard. So... Like I said, that's why I don't think it worked. Well, no, it's like you. It's like your your skill level as a writer wasn't prepared for what that story yeah. on a technical level necessitated. And yeah, coming back no, to it like years later, get more yeah. into it. I have story ideas where I'm like, I think that's going to be great. I know I am not skilled enough right now yeah, yeah. to write that. Me too. So I'm gonna tuck that little bad boy away in the back of my brain, mm -hmm. and maybe in five, ten years, I'll pull it out. You know, I think that's, oh, that's a valid thing. Well, sometimes it's good to just do it anyway. And push yourself, mm -hmm. I think. Maybe. Uh, do you two write short stories? I'm sorry, I should know this. Uh, I'm like dabbling in it right now just to kind of see how it goes. I know MJ writes much more short stories yeah, than I have. Yeah, good. I find short stories harder than, than novels personally, but I do write some of them. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's where you test it out. 
Yeah. Like sometimes you can take these really challenging. You still want you, the story is the thing, of, co- of course. That's the most important thing. But you have a really cool story idea and a, and a very challenging thing on a technical level. I think short stories are really good because it's going to take you a couple of weeks or a month, and if it fails, it fails. It's not two years of your life or three years of your life. However long it takes to write a book. So I think that I think that's a good testing ground. But I do like I do get excited by. Like I have a story idea and then I, at some point I'm like, oh, there's techniques you can use that are really fucking hard. I wonder if I could do it to tell the story. I do. Yeah. Anyway. Just challenge yourself a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, like, how was it writing for, because this is a bit of a side tangent, but we'll, we'll, we'll use it to wind down a little bit. Uh, writing an Aliens novel, like a tie-in novel to the Aliens universe, which is fucking awesome. I mentioned it at the top of Aliens, Aliens Bishop, but how did how did that come about? Like, how was it writing in that universe? Because you know you're tied to an IP, obviously. But yeah, it's it, I have mixed feelings about it. Overall, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I, I got into I got the offer for from Ghost of the Neon God, which you've read, and the reason I got it because of that. Oh, and Thirty Six Streets. But the reason I got it is that uh, the my agent was pitching Ghost. And it's an, there's an AI in it, and he was in the, in his pitch. He must have been talking about the AI, yeah. And there was a US editor he pitched it to, and he'd heard he knew that I wrote dark science fiction, and then he heard I was writing about artificial intelligence, and he said, "Look, I don't want a novella." So he didn't we didn't sell it to him. But he said, "But if he likes uh, he writes dark science fiction and he writes likes artificial intelligence, maybe he could write Bishop." in an Aliens novel. So that was the seed of the offer, um, to which I initially actually said no <laughs> um, because partly because I just wanted to keep doing my own work, partly because the time, fucking five months to write the novel, um, And there were a few reasons that I was reluctant, but I had writer friends just slap me around the head and say, shut up, just take the gig. It's awesome. You get to write Aliens novel. Yeah, yeah. And my agent said the same thing and he's like, you know, and he's like, you know, how good an opportunity it was and so forth. And so I changed my mind and said yes, and I'm glad I said yes. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd do it again because that writing, a, I can't, I don't have that. Uh, I know a lot of very fast writers and I know some people can write um, they can, a friend, I think he's been on the show, Richard Swan, has he been in, on your no, show? No, but I, I know Richard, yeah. Okay. Richard told me he wrote, uh, so for your viewers, he's a he's a really good fantasy author and he's a very good writer. He told me he wrote four books last year. And I'm like, bloody hell, how? <laughs> Doesn't he work a day he's job like, as well, like a lawyer too? No, 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 he's he's he, not. He's, he's full-time he's writing staged, now. He's, He's full time writer. Okay. He's formerly he's used to be a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so I I wrote it in five months, and I was so. In fact, one of the reasons I was reluctant to do it is because I don't. My name's on the cover, and I don't want to write a bad book. And I want it to be rushed. I want it to be up to a very high standard. And it's the aliens universe. I don't want to fuck up something in the aliens universe because that's a cool universe. Um. Anyway, I did it, and I'm glad I did. And the book's been very well received by fandom, um, very highly regarded. And so, uh, it and what's it write writing, writing someone else's IP? It's it's good and bad. I mean, they've done the world building for you in a way, so that part, I guess, I suppose, is easier. And there's a and there's a certain formula for an aliens book. I mean, there's got to be a xenomorph or more. And they've got to get out of captivity and kill people. Like that's going to happen at some point, we suspect. But I did get to expand the universe too. This is one of the things I love the most about it. Like there's a little bit about Australia in the Aliens universe. I took that and expanded on it. There's a little bit about China, the tiniest bit about China. I took that and expanded on it. There's nothing about Vietnam. So I took, I I put that in. Um, uh, And... And sure, it has Bishop, so it has characters they know, it has colonial marines, it has all the things people expect, cool space battles and all that. But I wanted to 
gives people i wanted to expand the universe isn't that what an expanded universe novel is meant to do <laughs> expand a universe so i did that i expanded the universe um uh, and it's a weird experience man because you're getting a publisher and a studio approving your work you know and i'd heard horror stories uh, i'd heard people people talk about meddling studio in particular like they came in and no and they gave you notes and you had to change everything you have like a book but, of um, like, like this is the canon or some shit like that like the, oh, well, I'll go back to that because there is stuff like that that you get um, and you certainly have timelines and technology and, and, and all the world building of the universe. But my experience with the studio was great. Like they were happy with everything and I just said, this is my treatment. You've got to give them ten page, a 10-page treatment that they accept and you've got to stick to it. But that was except for the except for the seed of the story, which is Bishop is – reactivated by Michael Bishop at the, after the end of Aliens 3. Except for that, it was my story. So, and I was bracing myself for studio notes. I got none or very two very minor ones, but almost nothing. Yeah. So I, my, I know other writers have had negative experiences. Mine wasn't. Um, they went with it. Um, and... I told the story I wanted to tell in that universe. And so it was pretty cool. In terms of the Bible, like these are the, the, the universe, it has thematic. There are some thematic um, rules, if you will, or pillars of the aliens universe, but they're like, I won't give you all of them, but they're like strong female characters, anti-corporate blue collar universe. Fucking awesome. You're like perfect. I'll do all of that. that sounds right up your alley. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, <laughs> I have to batch corporations in my alien novel. Oh, well, okay. I guess oh, I'll do that. No. Woe is me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a cool universe to write in. Dude, I'm so happy that your experience was positive, though. Cause, yeah, because yeah, like I've said, heard horror stories as mm, well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was a fever dream writing it that fast. It nearly broke me. That wasn't positive. Yeah, I would say five months. Um, is that to, from? Is that for f- more than first draft? That's from start to finish, whole deal. It was a good draft. So for me, it was a good third draft. Yeah. In four and a half months. And oh my that's, god! And like we were talking about the Escher Man taking me ten years. So there yeah. you go. Yeah, that's, see, the Escher that's- Man's probably more my pace. Just condense that all down. <laughs> right. You, yeah. you know what? You've just shown you can do it all. You can do the slower or the super speed. So it has. It has made me a slightly faster writer. See? There you go. That experience. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, to close out for part one of our interview uh, or our chat, um, can you give listeners, I'm going to ask for two things. One, a bit of good soundbite writing advice. I know we've already gotten a lot of advice from you, but we're greedy. We're going to get one more. Um, And then two is a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating. Uh, fuck. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, we had to put you on the spot, evidently. Uh, sound? Uh, well, writing advice soundbite. Okay. The two go- I'll give you the two golden rules and then the rule you don't, a rule you probably won't know about. The golden rule for writing is write as much as you can and read as much as you can. That's it. Good writers are good readers and read widely. Uh, authors disagree about a lot of things that are important in being a writer, I think just about every author worth their salt will agree on those two. Write as much as you can and read as much as you can. Oh, and I would say reading is part of your job. If you want to be a writer, reading is part of your job. The less well-known one would be, or the most underrated quality, is bloody-mindedness. You have to take the rejections and the pain and the writing into the void and the bloody mindedness I showed with the Escher Man, for example, uh, because maybe you'll get your first published novel published. Go fuck yourself, but well done. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> but for most of us, it's bloody mindedness uh, and it takes a certain resilience and perseverance and boring shit like discipline and hard work, but you need to be bloody minded because if you don't have faith in your work, no one else will. Uh, An interesting fact. Oh, bloody hell. Uh, 
An interesting fact. I don't know. I can't think of one. I only can think of someone else's interesting fact. I can't think of my own. Let's hear the. I can only think let's hear that one like, the, like Harvard or whatever is older than the the Aztec Empire. You know that one? What? Wow. Okay, you don't know it. All right, I'm stealing this. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna Google it. I'm gonna <laughs> cheat with my XM memory here. Harvard. What's the is no not Harvard. What's the one? What's the oldest British? Oh, Cambridge. Oxford. Cambridge, Cambridge or in Oxford. Oxford. Oxford is older than the Aztec Empire. I feel like I've this is like scratching like the ghost of something. I feel like I've heard this too. Yeah, Oxford University is older than the Aztec Empire. Yeah, by three hundred years. The Aztec Empire is like much more recent than most people realize too. Same with like yeah, the Maya. And yeah, Oxford 13. is much like, older. Like, yeah, and the Inca. The Inca there you go. Yeah. Someone else's fact. I have I no that. originality. Every, every fact is someone else's. Was I was going to say, I don't know that it's not like all of our guests are making up their own facts. So that's true. <laughs> well, no, what I mean is, it's not a fact that I care about. Like, normally okay. a fact that's interesting is like, here's something from me that shows you something important. And then I'm like, fuck, someone else said this once. So I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still utterly fascinating. Yes. So I say it counts. Yeah. And on that nonchalant note, we will wrap this up. Tonight. Oh, sorry, I've got a fact. Okay, let's go. Are you found? No are you- memories, and you no. Sorry, no memories are old memories. Every memory, every time you recall something, it's a new memory because it travels a different pathway and it travels between all the experiences you've had in that time, mm. uh, and it and it goes through that filter. So every time you recall something, you never it's new. It always has to travel the distance between the life you've lived since. There you go. There's a fact. Wow. Okay. So it's like memory Ooh. reincarnation. I love it. Yeah. All right, man. All right. Sorry. Well, you got, see, now you're excited about that one. I like right. it. You're like, okay, I feel better. <laughs> Let's do this, man. All right. Well, Tim, thank you so much for chatting with MJ and I today. It has been an absolute pleasure, my friend. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been good and not hard. I thought it was going to be hard. It hasn't been hard at all. Yeah, because it's with <laughs> us. The next part, the masterclass is going to be hard. But sorry. We'll, no, don't talking. worry, man. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, where can people find you online? <laughs> oh, uh, my uh, website is nappertime.com. <laughs> um, I have TR Napper on Instagram and Facebook and Blue Sky, but I'm the Escher Man on Twitter. And speaking of the Escher Man, go pick it up. It's available now. You can pick up 36 Streets, Neon Leviathan, Aliens Bishop. Uh, you got short stories all over the place. Go support Tim's work because he is a lovely human being. Um, we're very thankful that he hung out with us today. Um, you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, all that jazz at SFF Addicts Pod. You can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. If you want some mushrooms in your life, you can go pick up my debut novel, Mushroom Blues. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me across all the main socials at MJ Kuhn Books, all one word, um, or just check out MJKuhn.com for all my links, links to my books, links to my socials, everything. And buy MJ's books and support the Thorin Food Fund because her cat is a hungry boy. He's a hungry boy. He needs snacks. He's so hungry. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Tim for our mini masterclass on modernity and building believable futures. For now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts.